Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here. We are taking a look at our example three from our optimization unit. Uh, once again, if you're my students, you've got your notes to follow along with. Um, if you're a student outside of Avon High School, welcome. You are happy to have you along. Um, you can definitely take a look at the notes page if you're so interested by following the link um, in the description of the video down below. In this example, it says that you are swimming in the ocean one mile from the shore and you wish to get to a town three miles down the coast, but unfortunately this coast is extremely rocky. It says you're going to need to swim to the shore and then possibly walk along the rocky coastline. At what point would you swim along? And yes, we do know how to spell here, so let's get rid of that H. There we go. At what point would you swim to along the shoreline? so that the time it takes to get to the town is a minimum. You swim at two miles per hour, but you only hike along the rocks just slightly faster because of the rough terrain at four miles per hour. And it turns out that there are really, you know, three different ways that you can get from this point here as a swimmer to this point here in the town. And it's a really important facet of this problem that we understand the feasible domain. Um, that's the part of this problem that I think can give students some trouble. There's actually two very, very tricky features of this particular problem, this being the one, the first one. So the feasible domain, what we're talking about here. Well, the feasible domain is basically a um, set of uh, values that you would basically have for this variable x. The variable x in this particular case sort of indicates um, the variations upon that length x. For example, if you decide that you don't want to uh, swim at a diagonal whatsoever and this diagonal doesn't really exist, then there is no x there at all. You're basically swimming directly across that one mile, and then you're going to hike the three miles to the town. Maybe that's what you think is best. Um, if that were the case, then it's pretty clear that the left boundary for x would be zero. But if you're sort of the straight, uh, the shortest distance between two points as a straight line kind of person, maybe it's possible you're thinking that I'm going to go straight from this location all the way to the town, not going to deal with the rocky shore whatsoever, and thus that opens up this length here to be the entire x value, which obviously, according to our problem, can't be any bigger than 3. So that's sort of the, the dilemma that we're faced with. Our value of x can run from 0 to 3, or more complex, it could be anything in between you could decide to go ahead and swim at that diagonal, whatever that diagonal might be arbitrarily. So that's what we're faced with. So the very first thing that we want to do is figure out, well, what would be our, our formula for which to set up this problem? Well, that's, again, a little tricky because what you have to kind of say to yourself over and over again in this problem, what is it that you're trying to find the minimum of? Well. The answer is time. You want to minimize the amount of time. So it's, it's very easy for a student to want to set the problem up so that they're trying to minimize the value uh, for distance. And distance is obviously not the same as time. So I think the way that you can think about this, if you so desire, is you can say, well, OK, while I'm in the water, while I'm swimming in the water, you could fashion a distance that would really replicate this diagonal right here. And you would use the Pythagorean theorem. It's not difficult to see that the length of that diagonal would certainly be the square root of x squared plus 1. Right? We're just taking the, the sum of the squares of the other two sides, and then we'll take the square root to get that particular distance. So the distance in the water, I'll call it d sub w, would be square root of x squared plus 1. But remember, we are not trying to minimize distance. We are minimizing time. And we know that the distance is equal to rate times time. And particularly here, the distance square root of x squared plus 1 
is equal to the rate 2 times the time t. So then we solve for t just simply by dividing both sides by 2. And this becomes the first little piece of the part of the puzzle that you're trying to take um, the derivative of and ultimately minimize. So we could go ahead and start thinking about that. We could go ahead and say, all right, my primary equation, I'm going to use the abbreviation PE. If you haven't seen one of my other two videos, for example, one and two, I talk a little bit more in depth about the role of the primary equation and the secondary equation if it's needed. Um, I'm going to use capital T for time. It doesn't really matter what you use, but I know that I'm going to have to take in consideration the time I'm spending swimming, which is denoted by that. Now we need to figure out the time we're going to be spending along the land now. Well, obviously, if this entire length here is 3, and I decide that I'm going to subtract off this little bit of x that I will not have to be traveling, then I would get a result of 3 minus x for the remaining part that I must hike. So that would take care of our on land. Water would be blue, on land would be this lush green. So then the distance that we're traveling on land, we said, is 3 minus x. So once again, if we use the fact that the distance is equal to the rate times the time, then dl would be rt, or specifically then 3 minus x would be the rate at which we walk or hike on the land 4 times the time. So then my time here would be 3 minus x all divided by 4. And to be quite exact about this, I probably should have subscripted my times and my rates accordingly to each problem, but we're not going to make a real big deal out of that. Okay, so now I have a couple of t's that I can add together, one of which is already set into my formula. My next one would then consist of the quantity 3 minus x over 4, and now we are all set to have some derivative fun. We can take the derivative of this guy. Um, I'm going to treat this problem initially as if it were a no calculator problem. Um, it does get a little bit dicey at the end where some decimal values come into play. You certainly might have a, a need for a scientific calculator, but I don't want to use a CAS type of calculator like an Inspire or a TI-89 in this particular instance because I want to get some practice taking these derivatives. So we're all set to go. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps we might want to go ahead and uh, rewrite this particular expression so that it's a little bit more derivative friendly. So I'll just use the option of a fractional exponent to do that. And I'll kind of extract out a fraction of 1 fourth. So I think I'm all set to go. So now it's calculus time. T prime. Here we go. The 1 half and the exponent 1 half will multiply together. And the x squared plus 1 would then be lowered an exponent to the negative half. And then we use this thing called the chain rule, where we have to multiply by the derivative of what's inside. That's going to be a 2x. And then over for the second term, my 1 fourth coefficient just drops in place. The derivative of the 3 minus x is just negative 1. So I'm all set with him. And now we better do some simplifying, because this thing, quite frankly, is a mess. Just isn't very conducive to finding critical numbers just yet. So first thing I notice is that the 2 and the 4 cancel a little bit. And then I could decide to rewrite this result with the x on top the 2 on the bottom that would join the square root of x squared plus 1. Remember that x squared plus 1 to the negative half could be written as a radical x squared plus 1 in the denominator. And then, of course, a 1 fourth and a minus 1 would just become a minus 1 fourth when they're multiplied together. How to find the critical number from this point is entirely up to you. Um, I will admit that I am a self-proclaimed common denominator kind of person. I've been doing that with my students for quite some time because I think once a common denominator is arrived at, uh, while the algebra might be a little dicey to try to get that denominator, once you're there, I think finding the critical numbers becomes a lot easier. But you guys can do it whichever way that you want. Common denominator in this problem would consist of 
the uh, greatest common, uh, or the least common multiple, I should say, out of a 2 and a 4, which would obviously be a 4. And then the square root of x squared plus 1 will have to be a part of that as well. So as you can see, this first fraction only needs to be multiplied by a 2 over 2 to obtain that denominator. So the x would be multiplied by 2. And then over here, you can clearly see that the 1 would have to be multiplied by the square root expression. Now we have this, well, <laughs> I was going to say a simple, nice fraction. It's, there's nothing simple about that fraction. But we do have a single fraction, at least, that we can work with. So let's go ahead and get critical numbers going. First step, when is t prime equal to 0? Well, that would occur only when the numerator is equal to 0. And we find that that is the case when 2x minus the square root of x squared plus 1 is 0. I don't know if anyone is bothered by that, but it's a pretty common thing in these types of problems that if you have a derivative that is a fractional form, if you just think about it logically, if I want to say that this derivative has to be 0, when is a fraction ever equal to 0? And if you go all the way back to your elementary school days in arithmetic, that only occurs when the numerator is 0. The numerator can be anything other than 0, and you're not going to have your fraction equal to 0. So you set your numerator is equal to 0, and this is a pretty typical, what we call a uh, irrational, or I'm sorry, a um, sort of a, a radical type of equation that you would probably learn to solve by isolating the radical and then squaring both sides to lift away the square root symbol. And we're off and running here as we slowly get the x squared by itself so that we can then get the x by itself. And I said it was going to be a little little nasty looking, and it is. You would take the square root of both sides, which would give you the square root of 1 third. Um, you can rewrite this a variety of ways. The square root of 1, I'm sorry, 1 over the square root of 3 would work um, if you want to rationalize it. You could multiply the top by radical 3, the bottom by radical 3, um, and, and you would end up with, with this. Any one of those is acceptable, um, but all three of them are, are pretty ugly looking, I will admit. And it turns out that you're going to throw away one of those answers because it absolutely makes no sense for x to be a negative value in this case. We're not going to be swimming to this side. That makes no sense. So x can only be... And let's pick one of these forms. I'll have the positive version of 1 over radical 3. So that might be the optimal time value for x, 1 over the square root of 3 miles um, from the perpendicular point. Well, we have to also at least entertain the idea of whether or not there are any other critical numbers. And I'm going to write that down here while I still have the screen here. Is t prime undefined anywhere? Well, you're going to find out that this guy here, setting the denominator equal to 0, total waste of time because there is no value for x um, in the real number system over which that can be solved. So we only have the one critical number here. Now, does that mean that that's definitely the x value at which we're going to minimize our time? And again, that's where we have to be very careful. Because in this problem, we have our feasible domain that's defined on this closed interval, which means we are, in fact, trying to find a minimum over a closed interval. All right, perhaps you remember that as being called the finding of absolute extrema. So what we do need to do is put together some sort of an organizational scheme, like a chart, where we have our various values of x that we could plug in. That would be 0. 1 over the square root of 3, or 3, so that we can find our time. And if you forgot the time equation, and I'm going to erase this so I can write the time equation from up here was square root x squared plus 1 over 2 plus 3 minus x over 4. So I'm going to rewrite that. So we're going to plug in our values here. Well, if we were to plug in 0, that's kind of easy to do without a calculator. We would end up with the square root of 1 over 2, which is a half, 
plus 3 over 4. And if we add 1 half and 3 fourths, uh, you would get, what, 5 over 4, which is 1.25. So 1.25 hours. That's an hour and 15 minutes. That possibly might be the quickest route. Well, then we have to go to this value 1 over the square root of 3. Well, this is where you're going to definitely want to use the calculator. So give me a moment. I'm going to pull my calculator up, and we're going to take a look at it. And you'll notice here by looking at the calculator uh, procedure, um, what I did here, I'm using the TI Inspire, and, and I decided that it might be best to go ahead and define the function uh, t of x to be our original t. And at that point, I can very easily drop in the two different x values um, using decimal points here to get approximate values. And I end up getting uh, the, the answer is 1.183 and 1.581 if I decide to round to three places. So we'll go back to the document, and I can fill in those particular pieces, 1.183 and 1.581. And then you can just step back and compare and think, OK, which one of these happens to be the smallest? Clearly, it's this guy. So that pretty much tells you that you have your minimization occurring right here when the x value is 1 over the square root of 3. Now, we want to address this answer the correct way because the problem doesn't want what is that minimum time. I mean, it seems like that's important to the problem, of course. But we're asked to find the point right here along the shoreline at which we would achieve that minimum time. So we basically want to figure out, well, how far we are from, say, the perpendicular, or you could say how far you are from the town, whichever one's a little easier to write. Um, let's be honest, most of the time, I think it would probably be easier to say how far from the town that you would be. So we would have to figure out, uh, first of all, what is the value of 1 over the square root of 3, which is something that we haven't done yet. But I can very easily go back to my calculator here and just say, hey, let's, let's get a, a decimal approximation for this 1 over square root of 3. I'm going to put a decimal in here so that it will spit out an approximation here. So I have 0.5773. I'm going to go ahead and use that um, <clears throat> fourth decimal place here, 0.573 or 0.5774. And then I'll know that uh, really the distance from the town to that point is 3 minus x, so 3 minus point battery running low, so we better close out here. 3 minus 0.5774, and let's be completely lazy here, and we'll figure out what is 5 minus, or I'm sorry, 3 minus 0.5774, and we end up with the result 2.422 or 2.423 miles from the town. So we'll, so we'll say then the final solution would be that he should swim to a point 2.423 miles from the town, and that should take care of it. Anyway, I hope this helps, and I will see you next time.